While the fall of Lop Ninh was imminent on April 7th, Lieutenant General Nguyen Văn Minh was summoned to Saigon to meet with the Joint General Staff, the President, and the three other corps commanders. He requested reinforcements and argued that if An Lop fell, then not much would stand between the North Vietnamese and Saigon. Unfortunately for him, Three Corps was at the back of everybody's minds. General Minh had lost a full regiment, but in I Corps, the entirety of the 3rd Division was smashed and on full retreat with the nearby elite Marine Brigades. He was dismissed from the room. However, the Joint General Staff would later inform him that he would receive the 21st Arvind Division from 4 Corps, as well as the 1st Airborne Brigade, one of the elite units of South Vietnam. They were thinking of sending him the 9th Division initially, but Lieutenant General Ngo Quang Trung, one of South Vietnam's best generals and commander of 4 Corps, reasoned that the 21st was very well trained in search and destroy operations and had also been previously commanded by General Minh, so they should be the ones to go. After the meeting, President Nguyen Văn Thu declared on radio that An Lop would be defended to the death. This was confirmation that 3 Corps would receive the support it needed. It would be all or nothing, and the North Vietnamese listening in would try to take it at all costs as a result. It would be a morale disaster for South Vietnam if An Lop fell now. Back in Binh Long province, Task Force 52 in FSB's North and South watched in horror at the fall of Lop Ninh. Several days before, they had engaged North Vietnamese patrols. It was commanded by Colonel Tin, and he had the support of three American advisors, led by Lieutenant Colonel Chinger. On April 5th, General Hung ordered Tin to send a battalion north to reinforce Lop Ninh. He sent his 2nd Battalion of the 52nd Regiment, but they ran into an ambush on the way up. The FSBs fired 600 rounds of artillery in support, but it could not proceed any further. FSBs north and south then started to receive a massive bombardment. On the morning of April 7th, General Hung ordered Colonel Tin to withdraw Task Force 52 to An Lop. At 8.30 a.m., they started to move out, but 400 meters out, they were hit by an ambush. They could not proceed any further, so General Hung gave the order to destroy as much equipment as possible and move to An Lop by foot by bypassing the road. The two battalions were supposed to proceed evenly, but the 2nd Battalion of the 52nd Regiment were engaged in the rear by Pavan forces. They rushed forward and started to group up with the 1st Battalion of the 48th. At this critical point, artillery started to bombard the group. Airstrikes had to be called in at 1 p.m. to cover the troops. Unfortunately, they ran into a massive clearing. When they crossed, the task force would be completely exposed to enemy fire. The command team just started to cross and the North Vietnamese immediately opened fire. One of the advisors, Zimwalt, was severely wounded by a B-40 explosion and Lieutenant Colonel Ginger was forced to request a helicopter evacuation for the advisors. They would stay behind to be extracted while Colonel Tin and his soldiers would proceed to An Lop on foot. The rest of the day, there were two attempts to extract the advisors, which failed. They had to stay in the area throughout the night with a specter covering them. That morning, they were extracted by two OH-6s, along with numerous Arvin soldiers clinging onto the skids. At the same time, only around 600 of the original 1,000 soldiers of Task Force 52 made it to An Lop. It wasn't just Task Force 52 that arrived. At this time, many of the men that would fight in the city itself were arriving into the city. General Min ordered the 3rd Ranger Group and its 36th and 52nd Battalions to withdraw from the border to An Lop. They would arrive on April 7th. At the same time, the Vietnam Air Force was flying in as many supplies as they could. C-123s, Chinooks, and Hueys all flew in ammunition and food. For the Americans, General Hollingsworth ordered all non-essential administration and staff evacuated out of An Lop. Looking at the situation in MR1, Hollingsworth saw that pulling out the advisors shattered Arvin morale. He therefore informed the remaining advisors that they would stay and fight or die with their South Vietnamese counterparts. Colonel Yun, commander of the Rough Puffs, started to distribute M72 laws to his infantry as much as possible, as well as accommodating incoming refugees from Lop Ninh and other towns. He was regarded very highly by American advisors. Impressed by Nyut's own preparation, 
Colonel Miller attempted to persuade General Hung to give command of the defense to Nyut, but Hung did not reply. The working relationship between the two men fell into dysfunction. At this point in time, there was the Guan Lai position with two companies from the 1st Battalion, 7th Regiment. It was the last outlying location outside the city itself. This was where the first blow would fall. The North Vietnamese definitely had to get this position out of the way to fully surround the city. In the afternoon of April 6th, the previous day, they probed the perimeter of Guan Lai. The two armored companies managed to push them back with the help of some American Cobras. But on the evening of April 7th, several units of the 9th NLF Division used tear gas and nausea gas to push the companies out. The Arvin companies managed to destroy both of their 105mm guns and would make it to Anlop two days later on April 9th. It was at this point in time that the Airborne started to arrive. Hollingsworth had tried to get Min to send the Airborne 1st Brigade into Anlop as well, but Min decided to use them to try to break the roadblock between Anlop and Lai Kei. The 1st Airborne Brigade arrived in the town on April 8th. It had the 5th, 6th, and 8th Airborne Battalions. However, it also had the best battalion in the entirety of the Army of the Republic of Vietnam, the 81st Airborne Ranger Battalion. They combined the best traits of both the Airborne and the Rangers, both considered to be the best units South Vietnam could offer. It immediately started to proceed north up Highway 13. It then ran straight into a pavin position just three miles north of Jun Tan. This was the confirmation that North Vietnamese forces had An Lop fully surrounded. Fortunately for the South Vietnamese, the People's Army of Vietnam was still deploying its soldiers for the next couple of days. The heavy artillery, tanks, and armored personnel carriers would take time to move around the city. In this small break from the fighting, the Vietnam Air Force flew in as many supplies as it could. Also, Task Force 52 arrived on April 8th, and Hung immediately deployed them to the center of An Lop. Hung also ordered the 7th Regiment and two companies at Cam Le back to An Lop. On April 9th, the 9th NLF Division was almost in position to strike. It sent small probes at 5.30 a.m. from the east, west, and north, then withdrew at 9. The next day, they did the same thing and backed off at 7.15 a.m., but still, they would not commit to any serious attack. The 8th Regiment that was in Binyung Province was brought in by American helicopters on April 10th and 11th. The following day, the last of the 7th Regiment finished arriving into Anlop. Other than several 18th Division advisors that would fly in on the 12th, that would be the last of the men coming into Anlop before the battle. This force of roughly 3,000 would take the brunt of the first Pavin attacks. Fortunately for those in Anlop, the requested 21st Division from the Mekong Delta started to ship into Binh Long Province. The advance party arrived in Lai Khe on April 8th, then the 32nd Regiment arrived on the 10th. They started to deploy towards Jun Tan by truck and reached it without incident. The 31st Regiment started to arrive on the 11th. Pavin tanks and trucks were then reported to the northeast of Jun Tan, seemingly trying to cut the highway. General Nghi, commander of the 21st, immediately ordered a high-speed advance led by the 31st, supported by armor from the 9th Armored Cavalry Regiment, to cut them off. The task force heavily contacted the 101st Pavin Regiment, losing three tanks immediately. South Vietnamese Sky Raiders and American Phantoms and Stingers had to come in to provide support. In the chaos, the force retreated 6 kilometers. Unfortunately for the men in Anlau, this would only be a sample of what their rescuers would face trying to reach them. The soldiers of the 21st Division were facing the well-entrenched 7th Pavin Division. The remainder of the 21st, the 33rd Regiment and other supporting units finished being airlifted in on the 12th. General Min ordered them to hold their positions for now. There was still a heavy possibility that Pavin units would simply pull back from Anlop and just push straight towards Saigon. Back at Anlop, on April 12th, a Vietnam Air Force Chinook was hit directly with a mortar, ending all Chinook flights into Anlop. Supplies would have to be sent in by VNAF C-123s and C-119 fixed-wing transport aircraft. The anti-aircraft net was finally being set up around Anlop. It looked like the People's Army of Vietnam was ready to attack. Early on April 13th, 
the communists unleash a massive barrage of 7,000 shells on the city. At 4 a.m., the sound of tanks and trucks were reported outside of the city. Mines went off as North Vietnamese troops launched probes on the defensive perimeter. The barrage increased to the point where, at 5.30 a.m., the fuel and ammunition dumps were ignited. At 6 a.m., the People's Army of Vietnam launched two massive combined arm assaults from the northeast and west. A large column of T-54s and PT-76s came down the main northern road to An Long. Task Force 52, which had left all of their heavy weaponry back at FSB's north and south, panicked at the sight of the tanks. Colonel Tin, with the help of his advisors, managed to rally his troops and join the Rough Puffs. The 3rd Ranger Group and 8th Regiment also fell back from the assault, but managed to create defensive positions to hold on. Like the rest of 3 Corps Arvin soldiers, this was the very first time they ever had to fight tanks. To fill in the gap left by Task Force 52, General Hung ordered the Rangers to extend their lines to the center and fill in the gap, taking Colonel Miller's advice. Only the 7th Regiment did not fall back, but were pushed to the city limits. Even with the gap temporarily closed, the T-54s were still advancing down Highway 13 directly towards the 5th Division headquarters. Colonel Miller requested support and a flight of Cobras equipped with high-explosive anti-tank rockets flew in to strike the tanks directly. The first Cobra managed to destroy the first tank just north of the headquarters. Airstrikes were simultaneously called in on the air anti-aircraft fire around the city to make sure the Cobras could operate properly. The Cobras belonged to the 79th Aerial Rocket Artillery, nicknamed the Blue Max Squadron. Blue Max would come to be extremely important in providing direct fire for Arvin forces on the ground where tactical air and B-52 arc lights could not. Only they had the precision needed to destroy tanks right next to Arvin position. Even with Cobras destroying many tanks, they continued rolling down the street. It was at this point that three Rough Puffs gathered the courage to destroy a T-54 that had reached the south gate with M-72 laws. On the west side, a single Rough Puff soldier overcame his fear and hit a T-54 right under the turret, destroying it. To the northeast, a single ranger ran out to destroy a T-54 by himself. The advisor, Captain Moffat, said that this single event electrified the rangers. Up until now, even the advisors themselves weren't sure if the small tube weapon could take out a whole tank. American soldiers themselves never went up against T-54s in Vietnam. Except for I Corps advisors just two weeks ago, American soldiers never had to use laws against tanks. But with the small acts of courage, Word spread quickly amongst the South Vietnamese soldiers. Troops all over the city ran out to destroy the tanks. Many of the tank crews themselves had completely outran their infantry support. They were left completely blind and vulnerable, randomly rolling around Antelope's streets. Because of this, tanks were destroyed throughout the city. Four more tanks were knocked out. Another tank decided to fire all of its ammunition into a Catholic church, killing over 100 civilians praying inside. The crew climbed out to surrender after using all of their ammunition and nearby South Vietnamese soldiers who witnessed this responded by emptying their rifles into the crew. Even with tanks running around An Lop, infantry were still assaulting the perimeter of the city. Due to three of the major units falling back in chaos, General Hung and the rest of the 5th Division HQ were not sure where their soldiers were. Tactical airstrikes were deployed well behind An Lop since the pilots didn't want to hit their own soldiers, but it also missed the majority of North Vietnamese troops. However, Cobras, with their onboard precision equipment, could distinguish targets much more easily. Cobras themselves managed to stop a tank column by destroying the lead, middle, and last tank. Even then, five of the Blue Max Cobras were shot down on April 12th. There was another assault at 10 a.m. from the northwest. A T-54 managed to break through and rolled around the city until it reached the province HQ and got stuck. There was only one 105mm cannon left in the city as the bombardment destroyed the rest. Rough Puff Captain Kai lowered his cannon and aimed it straight at the T-54 to destroy it. Colonel Nyut promoted him to Major right there. However, by 11.30, the 9th Division managed to take the northern part of An Lop. They were extremely close to overrunning Arvin position. Only airstrikes managed to slow the attacks enough for them to be held off. American advisor Wilbanks later stated that the Cobras were often the difference between victory and defeat. Of course, strike aircraft, fighters, and gunships were present to hit targets further from the front lines. In the morning of April 13th, the situation stabilized. The fighting devolved into house-to-house -house fighting, 
as both sides fought over every single inch of Anlop. At the end of the day, with the first assault unsuccessful, Pavan forces pulled back, allowing Arvin soldiers in Anlop to relax under the constant bombardment of heavy artillery. All tanks that had made it within the perimeter were destroyed. The defense structure for Anlop was now set in stone. General Hung commanded the Arvin ground troops, while Colonel Miller directed American air support. Advisors made sure that they were always awake 24 hours to ensure total coverage of air support. If they had no artillery, then heavy firepower had to come from airstrikes instead. At this point, i was starting to stabilize and B-52 arc light strikes could start to be diverted to the area. On the morning of April 14th, Pavan forces pulled back a little bit, pouring in artillery fire. Then at 7.45 a.m., a combined assault of nine T-54s and two anti-air tanks struck from the northwest with some infantry squads and made it within 100 meters of the 5th Division headquarters before being pushed back by airstrikes and Arvin infantry. It was during this time that Arvin soldiers developed dedicated tank hunting teams that would run around to destroy tanks. These teams would hit the tanks from basements or second floors so that the tanks couldn't hit them back. Also, the Pavan infantry were held back by the front lines while the tanks broke through, leaving their armor completely vulnerable. By the end of April 15th, infantry had destroyed 18 tanks and Cobra gunships got 12. The 5th Division's 2nd in command, Colonel Lei Nguyen Bi, himself destroyed 4 of them. But it wasn't just the infantry and tactical airstrikes inflicting damage on the North Vietnamese. B-52 arc lights were especially devastating, annihilating everything within a 1km by 10km box and debilitating anybody within one kilometer of the strike zone. In one attack, a battalion was caught directly northwest of Anla by an arc light right before it entered the city. Three tanks were destroyed, and an estimated 100 men were killed. However, even with the airstrikes and South Vietnamese infantry holding on, the communist bombardment increased in intensity. The same day, General Min ordered the 1st Airborne Brigade to disengage from their positions on Highway 13 to be redeployed directly to Anlop. Its 6th Battalion entered the battlefield at 4 p.m. near Hill 169, southeast of Anlop via helicopter. They immediately raced the North Vietnamese on the other side of the hill for the top, and their advisors had to call airstrikes for support. In a desperate situation, one of the airborne companies performed an infantry charge to force the North Vietnamese right off the hill. The arrival of the Airborne, one of the elite units of South Vietnam, greatly boosted the morale of the remaining men in Anlop. The South Vietnamese forces in Anlop has survived another day. The next morning, April 15th, Pavan opened with a barrage at 4.30 a.m. It focused on the city center itself and set many of the buildings on fire. At 6 a.m., two combined armed thrusts led by tanks were launched from the north and west. After learning how to chase down and destroy the tanks on the 13th, the South Vietnamese soldiers knew to let the tanks push ahead of the infantry. While the North Vietnamese infantry could not keep up and were bogged down by the perimeter, the tanks were easily killed by M72 logs. South Vietnamese soldiers were so confident at destroying tanks, they competed to see who could kill the most. However, the scale of the attack pushed the 8th Regiment back several streets before they managed to re-establish a new defensive line. At 10 a.m., the communists launched another massive attack. The entire 271st Regiment engaged the west, while in the southeast, they reached the barbed wire. A tank made it to 100 meters of the 5th Division command bunker, firing directly into it and wounding three officers. An American Cobra had to be called in to destroy the tank. At this point, the anti-air net was so intense that aircraft had a difficult time to provide supporting fire and taxi out the wounded. At 2 p.m., another attack was launched from the west with 10 tanks. Nine of them were destroyed by strike aircraft. The 271st Regiment continued assaulting the western perimeter of Anlop until an arc light landed right in its location. An entire battalion was destroyed, stopping the attack. At the same time, the 5th and 8th Airborne Battalion, along with the crack 81st Airborne Rangers, landed southeast of Anlop, then moved towards the city. The 6th Battalion stayed behind to build an FSB for six 105mm cannons being lifted in. The entire 1st Airborne Brigade was now in the fight for Anlop. If the Airborne were here, it was all or nothing. During the fighting, a group of 200 refugees tried to break out of the city, led by a Catholic priest. 
The communists opened fire with rockets and artillery, killing many of them and driving the survivors back into Anlop. The food and medicine situation in the city was worsening, and the Vietnam Air Force could not send enough in. The AA net was so intense that flights had to be made at 5,000 feet, and at that altitude, supplies falling via parachute drifted completely off target. Worse yet, a Vietnam Air Force CU-123 was shot down, killing all on board. The United States Air Force, in response, started its own resupply missions with C-130s. Three C-130s flew in at a low altitude of 600 feet, using computers to calculate when to drop the supplies. The Pavan anti-air net barely reacted in time to fire at the first aircraft and only managed to damage its rudder. However, the second C-130 flew directly into a wall of anti-air fire. It killed the flight engineer and wounded two other crew members. Ammunition pallets started to ignite and explode seconds after exiting the plane. Two engines were destroyed and the plane barely made it back to Dun Sen Yat Air Base, with a third engine failing at the last second. The last C-130 did not start its resupply run due to technical issues. None of the supplies were ever recovered by soldiers in Anlop. This would only be the very first of many failed resupply attempts by both American and Vietnamese flight crews. On April 16th, the battle relaxed. The bombardment continued relentlessly firing up to 2,000 shells into the city, but the 9th NLF Division had exhausted its manpower for direct assaults. It was in the afternoon that airborne battalions were in position to push through the communist circle to get into the city. The 8th Battalion reached South Anlop without engaging, but the 5th Battalion fought Pavan forces for six hours before they withdrew. The 5th Airborne made defensive positions east of Anlop. The elite 81st Airborne Rangers took position in the northeast corner. Immediately that evening, its commander requested that the 5th Division stop all use of flares. Its soldiers started to immediately clear out houses in complete darkness. Even in the break in fighting, the ammunition dump in Lai Kei was hit directly, resulting in 8,000 artillery shells being completely destroyed. Another group of refugees, this time led by Buddhist monks, was cut down again by communist artillery when they tried to escape Anlop. Two C-130s attempted to resupply the city. They were hit directly by anti-air fire, but managed to drop 30,000 pounds of supplies. The following day, a C-130 ran into a wall of anti-air fire and was forced to crash land near Lai Kei. The resupply missions were still very risky for small gains. On April 17th, the bombardment continued, but the 9th and 11th Division did not launch any new assaults. The first major North Vietnamese assault on Anlop ended with the South Vietnamese barely holding on. However, the worst of the fighting had yet to come. On April 18th, Border Rangers engaged Pavan forces near Dong Le Jam and found documents on a political officer. The first letter reprimanded the 9th NLF Division for failing to take the city. But it was the second letter that was more concerning. It was a plan for new attacks to take Anlop. The 9th 271st Regiment would attack from the west like before, the 272nd from the north, and the 95C Regiment from the northeast. Two additional regiments from the 7th and 5th Divisions entered the battlefield. The 5th NLF Division's 275th Regiment and the 7th Pavan Division's 141st Regiment would smash the 6th Airborne position on Windy Hill. The 5th NLF, which had taken Lop Ninh, were resupplied, refreshed, and started to reach Anlop to join the fight. In total, this was 5 infantry regiments, along with supporting armored, artillery, and anti-aircraft units operating in Anlop. The Relief Force the 21st Arvind Division from the Mekong Delta were completely bogged down trying to make it up Highway 13. They were trying to force their way northwards and fighting was reduced to complete attrition trying to make it to the city. For the South Vietnamese forces, it was clear that this wasn't just some small cutoff force on the highway, but the entire 7th Pavan Division facing them. While South Vietnamese forces in Anlop had survived, there wasn't much hope for survival in the near future. The North Vietnamese controlled half the city, the 5th Division advisor, Colonel Miller, was pessimistic and said that the division is tired and worn out. Supplies minimal, casualties continue to mount. Medical supplies are low, wounded a major problem. Mass burials for military and civilians, morale at a low ebb. In spite of incurring heavy losses from US airstrikes, the enemy continues to persist. His relationship with General Hung collapsed completely. With the new communist assault planned and on the way, it didn't look like there would be much to stop it. 
The North Vietnamese were so confident in their victory that they declared on the radio that Anlop would be taken on April 20th. 